Hello everybody and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 773, 773, Monday, May the 6th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, the first thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, a video some of you may have seen uh, from Jack Posobiec. Um, now, I'm not 100% you know, gung-ho Jack Posobiec guy. I think he's okay. I think he does a pretty good job. But uh, he likes to break a lot of stories, and that's fine. I love it when people break stories, but he's not always right. So uh, anyway, this particular thing I'm going to talk about here is uh, kind of one of these breaking stories. I checked around to see if there's anyone else that's confirming this or anyone else has got the story, and I can't really find anyone uh, who's really other than people who are watching his channel and using him as a source. But other than uh, Jet Pisobic as the source for the story, no one else really has any other source on this. So. Uh, it's worth um, talking about, though. I'm not 100% convinced that it's, you know, you know, totally sourced and it's true, but uh, it's certainly worth looking at. So, anyway, Pasobic does this video where uh, he drops a couple bombshells, and he's basically m making the case that he's got sources, okay? So he was in military intelligence, and uh, so he's got these sources that tell him that the counterintelligence operation on Michael Flynn was set up by McCabe, and McCabe, and that at the time McCabe set up that counterintelligence operation, that he knew that Michael Flynn was acting as a source for the DIA, the direct, the um, Defense Intelligence Agency, where he used to be head of. But after leaving the DIA, he continued to remain a source and apparently, before going on that uh, trip to Moscow for that RT celebration dinner, he had done a, a briefing, a pre-briefing before he left, and then a debriefing after he returned, and that that entire thing that he attended was paid for and all that kind of stuff, but that he was, at the same time, acting as a source. Uh, he wasn't spying for the Russians. He was spying on the Russians. So he was there... Uh, on a dual mission per se. He was there uh, obviously is because he was uh, invited uh, and paid to do a speech or what have you but at the same time he was also acting as a source kind of spying for the Defense Intelligence Agency which is of course the military's version of the CIA. So it appears from what Posobiec is saying that McKay was well aware of these facts but he opened up this counterintelligence operation anyway. Now, Posobiec is saying that the reason that Flynn did not use this uh, evidence to defend himself uh, in the charges uh, against him by, by Mueller is because in doing so, he would have given up sources and methods and that he's too much of a patriot to give up sources and methods uh, just to save his neck. Okay? Also, the fact that this, that this intelligence, this information he would need to clear himself only exists within the files of the DIA, that the DOJ doesn't have it, the FBI doesn't have it, the CIA doesn't have it, that it's just within military intelligence. I guess that could be true. He also says that, um, and he's only got one source on this, <clears throat> says he's trying to get another source, he says that also at that RT dinner <clears throat> was Joseph Mifsud. Now, again, I don't know if this is true, but if it is true, it's very interesting to say in the least. So if that is true, though, if Mifsud was there, then we can assume it must have been Mifsud who gave the intelligence uh, of that to British intelligence because it appears more than likely that Misfits' connections were in the in the U.S. to the State Department, and in the intelligence community, more to British intelligence. That's kind of what it looks like to me. I, I could be wrong, uh, so we'll just have to keep uh, waiting for the report to come back on Misfit. But uh, that's that's kind of what I think. So we can assume that if Misfit was there and was observing Flynn, uh, that he would have passed this information on to uh, British intelligence and then on to the CIA. Now. I'm not sure why this would have been something a spy would have felt the need to 
pass on to intelligence. I mean, it was a public thing. It was broadcast live. You could watch it on TV. Not only was Flynn and and what's her name, the Green Party chick, not only were they there sitting at the same table as Putin, but there was a bunch of Hollywood folks there. Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn were there. Um, and I can't remember all of them, but there was a bunch of Hollywood celebrities that were also there. I mean, there was a lot of Western people, a lot of Americans at that RT celebration dinner. And we should also keep in mind that this would not have been the first time that intelligence would have been making contact with Flynn or trying to set him up. Because prior to this, Halper, Stefan Halper, the fat man, had invited Flynn to the London Center. That's where they set him up with this woman, Lakova, where they arranged for him to be seated, seated next to her. And then Christopher Steele promptly plopped himself down right behind them, inconspicuously, and eavesdropped on them. And that was, of course, passed to British intelligence or through the U.S. Embassy onto the CIA and then on to FBI. So this is a fairly interesting uh, piece of news. Uh, if it turns out to be true, it's just, uh, you know, <laughs> it's just another brick in the wall, I guess you'd say. Um, so we'll have to wait and see if anyone else uh, jumps on this story, but uh, I, I think it's possible uh, would certainly Flynn would certainly become even more of a hero if this is true because it means that he would have had evidence that would have uh, cleared him and not only would he not uh, try to expose that I mean he didn't even try to you know use it in his defense behind closed doors with the judge and say, hey I got some evidence that, that, that will clear me but uh, it's it will reveal sources of methods so it can't get outside this courtroom but you would think that he would have found a way or his attorney would have found a way to get that information, uh, that intelligence, and have it sealed by the court uh, because it's national security. And the fact that he didn't makes me a little suspicious. So I think uh, the jury's a little bit out on this story yet. I wouldn't doubt if Misfit was there. Um, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll wait and see. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. I just thought you guys might be interested in that. It's out there. You can watch the video if you want. You know, it's Jack Posobiec. I think he uploaded it on Friday. So you can check it out. I've watched it twice. It's about a half an hour long on the video, but he gets to most of the major stuff in the first 10 minutes or so. Uh, the other 20 minutes is just kind of rambling on. Um, but yeah, you can take a look at that. Now, the more I look at uh, what we have learned from the as Devin Nunes calls the Mueller dossier. <laughs> the more we look at the Mueller dossier, the uh, report put together by Uncle Bob the Executioner and the Hillary Donor Posse, the more uh, I am under the belief that this is looking more and more. I mean, I know that this was what this was. I mean, Mueller was brought in, uh, more passing the baton from Comey to Mueller to continue the operation to frame Trump. Um or if not be able to, to uh, obviously Mueller came in after Trump was elected, so the original plan with Comey was to, was to damage Trump to where he would not get elected, but he, he did get elected, he did win the election, then by the time that Uncle Bob comes in, you know, it's the effort to cover up the crimes that they committed in trying to destroy Trump and keep him from getting elected on top of trying to come up with uh, whatever they could to get him impeached or force him to resign or throw him out of office or destroy him so bad that he cannot govern and is, you know, automatically uh, loses in 2020 or what have you. So, uh, Mueller, uh, the more that you look at the do the uh, uh, Mueller dossier, the Mueller report, whatever you want to call it, the more that this becomes obvious. Now, I, I, I figured this out a long time ago, even before the Mueller report came out, I knew this. Um, but now that the Mueller report is out, and we can look through it and see all the problems, not so much what's in the report, but what's not in the report. And when you look at all the things that are not in the report or which things are in the report that are being misreported, um, <clears throat> the more it's going to become obvious, even eventually to Barr and Horowitz and Republicans and probably even some honest liberals, that Mueller was not playing it straight. Now, he's still getting the recognition by people like Lindsey Graham and 
others who are saying, yeah, well, you know, Mueller did his report, blah, blah, blah. But I haven't heard any anyone in that realm come out and say, you know, Mueller was, uh, you know, he was part of the plot. I haven't heard anybody saying that yet other than like Louis Gohmert and a couple other people have suggested, ah, he may have been part of the plot to come in and take over. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So just a few things that, that I guess stand out to me why you can make this case and why at some point Barr or Horowitz or somebody as they're going through this and as this is playing itself out and uh, uh, being investigated, someone's eventually, the light bulb eventually has to go on and you're going to have to admit that, you know what, there's no way Mueller could have been this out to lunch and missed this many things and got this many things wrong and left this many things out. There's no way. He had to be biased. And if you look at that Mueller report, you'll find that there's no mention whatsoever of Glenn Simpson. There is no mention whatsoever of Confusion GPS. And they never use the word dossier. Well, I mean, here's the main people responsible uh, for the uh, Fusion GPS and Glenn Simpson, the main primary people responsible uh, for providing the information, the dossier, which is also never mentioned by name in the Mueller report, for all the investigations that were launched. I mean, Mueller says, yeah, you know, information. Uh, so we're looking into Manafort, Papadopoulos, and Carter Page. <laughs> all the guys, and Cohen, all these guys mentioned in the dossier, but uh, with the exception of Papadopoulos, who, was, uh, of course, came about from the Halper Downer setup, but, and Misfit, but most of these guys that he spends most of the time on this investigation on, this is all stuff from the dossier, from Confusion GPS and Glenn Simpson. How can you not mention the name of the guy who owns the company that was responsible for, for putting together much of the evidence that's used uh, that, that he investigated, supposedly? He never gets to the bottom of any of it, yet uses the information from it. Never cites the source, but he investigates Cohen, he investigates uh, Papagopoulos, he investigates... Um, um, Carter Page, he investigates Flynn, he investigates all these people, but never bothers to talk about the source as if we were all just going to forget about it and not bring it up. I mean, it's just, at some point, someone's going to have to discover that that's very odd. He also says in his Mueller report that it describes Misfit as a Russian intelligence asset. And anybody who did even a simple Google search in five minutes could learn that Misfit cannot be Russian intelligence asset unless our entire intelligence community in the Western world is completely nuts or stupid or ignorant or incompetent because he's hanging out with nothing but a bunch of Western spies. He's a professor and instructor at the school where they train Western spies. He's hanging out with a bunch of Western spies. <laughs> he, he's doing, uh, he's connected to an organization that works with the U.S. State Department. And they, and, and they think he's a Russian spy? <laughs> no way. It will be proven that he's a Western intelligence asset and that it was known all along. <clears throat> and again, at that point, you got to look and say, there's no way that Mueller's team could have just gotten this wrong. Couldn't have just gotten this wrong. There's no way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uncle Bob the Executioner admits in the Mueller report that he never looked at the DNC server. Only looked at a screenshot given to us by who? CrowdStrike. And of course, we've already talked about who the people are that run CrowdStrike. They hate Trump and they really hate Putin. And the... The number two guy there is a former FBI um, cyber uh, technician, you know, an expert. And if anybody could have copy and pasted some Russian troll job onto the DNC server and taken a screenshot of it, it's him. And remember, it was Michael Sussman, the lawyer for the Rotten Reverend Clinton, who brought in CrowdStrike. 
and then refused the, uh, for the DHS and the FBI to allow them to come and look at the server. How convenient. They say in the Mueller report, they just go with the narrative that uh, the DNC was hacked by the Russians, yet they really never verified it. They also go with the narrative that the Russians gave the emails to WikiLeaks, despite the fact that the one guy who would know, Julian Assange, uh, has denied that and said it was not the Russians or any state actor. They never, ever interviewed Assange. Now, you know, they had some leverage with Assange. They probably could have got something out of him. In fact, I'm not so sure they couldn't have subpoenaed WikiLeaks servers. They didn't make very much of an effort to verify. They just put it in the Mueller report as if it's like some sort of a known fact. Despite the fact there has never been any evidence presented, as far as I know, that the Russians transferred the stolen emails to WikiLeaks. It's just like the accusation's made and all of a sudden it's, it's a fact. Finds its way in the Mueller report as a fact. It's not. It's never been proven. At some point, someone investigating the Mueller investigation is going to stumble onto all of these facts. <clears throat> and of course, they make very little to do in the entire Mueller report about the fact that there was less than roughly about $100,000 spent by the, uh, by the trolls at the troll farm in Macedonia, allegedly, Macedonia, allegedly working for the uh, British or uh, Russian GRU, you know, I mean, $100,000 and a lot of those ads appeared after the election and not all of them were even totally in favor of Trump. Some were Hillary. Uh, I mean, that's not even, I mean, the right Reverend Clinton was spending more than that, more than $100,000 uh, easily probably in a week. Not to mention she was getting millions and millions of dollars of free advertising from all the major media networks and cable networks and newspapers and everything else. I mean, the, the, the amount of input uh, from the Russian trolls was microscopic compared to the overall $1.2 billion, not to mention another probably half billion worth of free advertising by the networks, cable stations, and uh, newspapers. I mean, it does, it's, it, I, I, I can't see uh, where the, even one vote might have been changed, you know, but they, they never point this out really throughout the entire uh they, they do point out roughly how much money they believe was spent and this and that and the other thing, but they never really make any point of this. It's just sort of, it's, it's thrown in as if it fits into all this massive activity. They try to make in the Mueller report look like there was a massive effort. When in fact, when you boil it right down, that really wasn't a massive effort at all. It was a very minuscule effort, which would have had zero impact when you look at the total amount of other activity going on uh, on the other side. It's um, it's just, it's a very bad representation of the truth. Let's just put it in those words. So I think you can only conclude when you look at the Mueller report and look at what we know now and look at what Mueller had to have known, had to have known a long time ago, how he could write a report that reads like this one does. You can only conclude that Uncle Bob the Executioner and the Hillary Donor Posse were part of the coup. And I certainly hope that when we get to that point in the fork in the road, that someone has to say, you know what? It sure looks like Uncle Bob the Executioner and his folks were part of this thing. I think we eventually have to get there, man. You can't let Uncle Bob off the hook. He did the country a tremendous disservice. <clears throat> he could have cleared Trump in a week. He could have um, debunked the dossier in a week. Drug it on for over two years. <clears throat> well, it looks like Jerry Nadler is going to file contempt charges against Barr on Wednesday. Um... So, let me tell you how I think Barr should handle the situation. Yeah, go ahead. Let Jerry Nadler file contempt charges against 
William Barr on Wednesday because there was really no reason Barr didn't have to release a single page of the Mueller report, but he did. He has released it all. He's even released two versions, one for the general public and one for just members of Cong Congress, which they can go look at in a skiff. The only thing that's not in there is grand jury testimony because that's by law. He can't do anything about that. He cannot make that public or even show that to the Congress. Not a single Democrat has gone over to look at the redacted version, uh, the, the more redacted version, um, unredacted, the more unredacted version uh, that's available at the skiff. Not a single Democrat's gone to look at it. And so I think that you can make a very strong argument, <clears throat> especially when you look at that document that, that, um, that Nadler signed along with Cummings and Waters uh, to a pact that they signed to go after the president and anyone in his uh, orbit. That would be William Barr as well. So in other words, I think it would not be very hard for Barr to prove that this is all um, just political gamemanship and that what they're trying to do by going after Barr is to prevent him from being able to do the investigation that he wants to do. In other words, they want to obstruct Barr from being able to do his job. Jerry Nadler is trying to obstruct Barr's investigation. So if I'm William Barr, as soon as Nadler goes and files that contempt on him, I turn around and charge Jerry Nadler with obstruction. And I have them take him out of the Congress during a session in handcuffs and charge him with obstruction. He's obstructing an, uh, the Attorney General's investigation and he's doing so just for polit on a political whim. All politics. No reason whatsoever. No reason whatsoever that he's got to be uh, hitting the Attorney General with a contempt charge. He's just obstructing, attempting to obstruct the investigation. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> my advice to Attorney General Barr is if Nadler goes and files that contempt charge, I would slap Nadler with an obstruction of justice charge. I'd make sure that I have him arrested so that he's taken away <laughs> on C-SPAN in cuffs, hauled out of a session where he's the chairman. <laughs> he's the chairman. Just send the cops in and arrest him. The Metro Police send him in and arrest him. Take him away. Charge him with obstruction. That's exactly what I would do. But that's just me. I like to play a little hardball from time to time. Well, it appears that the Federal Bureau of I'm With Her uh, has lost the notes from August 25th meeting with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. Uh, and this is in regards to the Rotten Reverend Clinton's private server. If you remember what happened, give you the real quick version of it. Charles McCullough, who was the IC, the, in the Intelligence Community Inspector General, he discovered that the Chinese were essentially living on the Rotten Reverend Clinton's private server. He passed this information up through the chain of command. It eventually made it to two agents who went and interviewed. Peter's been stroking us at least once, a couple other people in the FBI, and I think even McCabe got a briefing on this. And there were supposed to be notes. Louis Gohmert is the one who's been trying to get this, uh, track this down. So after these FOIA requests and digging and digging by Gohmert and some others, now they're being told that the FBI has lost the notes from that August 2015 meeting with the ICIG about the Rotten Reverend Clinton's private server. There should have been a CD containing material and notes from that meeting, which the ICIG, um, which details what the ICIG discussed with the FBI in these meetings. But they find now that the CD, uh, the compact disc, which has the information on it, has a crack in it. It's damaged, broken, and therefore the info cannot be, information cannot be, uh, I can't get the information off of it, and therefore it's considered missing. <laughs> but there's also notes, handwritten notes from that meeting, and it appears that they're missing also. And if you remember, of course, the ICIG had reported 
that there were 30,000 plus emails that were hacked by China. So there's one way to solve this problem and that is simply to re-interview all the players. Go find those FBI agents, Mr. McCullough, the other two guys from the IC, uh, IG's office, go find McCabe, go find Strzok, go find what other uh, FBI agents were involved and have them recreate the meetings they had and what they talked about. That's what I would do. <clears throat> now it is time to announce the winners of the Dumbass of the Week. Stiff competition again this week. We almost had, we had, almost had, you know, almost had three two-way ties. We still went up with one two-way tie and two clear winners. So let's go ahead and go through the list. Of course, we had Oregon, who was uh, <laughs> nominating Steve Cohen. He's, of course, the chicken-eating fool. Um, and, uh, of course, he also nominated himself. <laughs> okay, so you might want to read his comment if you want to know why that is. Uh, of course, uh, Gordon... Uh, he went with Pelosi and Nadler. And Jerry Nadler is very popular uh, right about now. Uh, Brenda, she went with uh, Maisie Hirono. No question about it, Maisie Hirono, very, very uh, much a dumbass of the week for her behavior. It was absolutely, ins absolutely insulting. I mean, she should never be in the Senate. Maybe she really shouldn't even be in the House, but she absolutely should not be in the Senate. She's not Senate material, if you know what I mean. So Brenda went with Maisie Hirono and Nadler. We have a Hua Jatola chick, uh, and I'm probably blowing that pronunciation, Hua Jatola chick. Uh, she likes old Foghorn Leghorn Cohen. <laughs> Foghorn Leghorn. <laughs> that was good. Very well done. Uh, yeah, she's voting for Cohen, the chicken man. Uh, let's see, John Juan, he went with Cohen as well, and Nadler. Uh, Beautiful Brown, she of course also went with Cohen. Joe Mack, he likes Ocasio-Cortez, the wild-eyed commie. And again, uh, her little deal there was uh, totally humorous. We had Jamie, he went with Nadler, Maisie Hiromo, and Pelosi. Alan went with uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, somebody else here went with Pelosi. I forgot to write down their name. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but another vote for Pelosi. Uh, Roy C., he went with Crazy Maisie. Crazy Maisie Hirono. Thomas, he went with Kamala Harris. Yes, uh, she she definitely had a few uh, things this week that would have qualified her uh, for Dumbass of the Week. I mean, she's always a, a you know plenty of um, plenty of material there with Kamala Harris every time. Really, she opens her mouth. Quite honestly, um, Gary, he likes Comey, the um, the Rotten Reverend Clinton, and Ocasio Cortez. Yes, let's not forget Comey in his radio interview on Friday and some of the crap that came out of his mouth. The problem is, for Comey, he keeps running this stuff. He, he, it's, it's maybe works for PR, but ultimately when he finds himself in front of a grand jury, he's going to have to talk about what the evidence was to do all the things he did. He talks about the things he did and, you know, well, the Russians, the Russians, the Russians. But the problem is, is that there was the spying and all the things that they were doing were happening um, uh, long before any of official the investigations were open, uh, whether it was the Operation Crossfire Hurricane or whether it was getting the FISA on Carter Page. That stuff all happened in the fall of 2016. The uh, efforts being made against the Trump campaign go back to uh, spring of 2015. <laughs> they, were, they were working on Trump a year and a half before all that. And that's what he can't explain. And that's why he's definitely been going to be indicted. And don't forget, I believe it's this week. In fact, Wednesday, I think, is when we get the uh, Comey memos. The memos that Comey made outlining the entire plot. <clears throat> Which he did is kind of a cover your ass, but they're going to end up biting him in the ass. Because those notes uh, detail what, what they did. But unfortunately, they were not going, they're not going to have the evidence uh, to back up the things that they were doing to go along with his timeline in his notes. That's the problem they're going to have. They had no reason to launch any investigations in the first place, other than Hillary's dirt, <clears throat> which was a hoax. Mike G., he went with Ocasio-Cortez, uh, uh, Cohen, of course, the Foghorn Leghorn, <laughs> and Jerry Nadler. Then we had Gene. 
Gene went with Cohen, Ocasio-Cortez, and Pelosi. And of course, the lovely and talented Mora, she went with Sherry Nadler, very good choice, Nancy Pelosi, and Ocasio-Cortez. So, it looks like winning first place this week, again, we have a tie. We do have a tie. Uh, by the way, I voted for uh, Cohen, myself, number one, and Hirono, number two. I had two choices this week, and I think uh, AOC would have been number three. So, it looks like first place is going to be a tie between um, Foghorn Leghorn, <laughs> uh, Cohen, and Jerry Nadler. They share first place this week for Dumbass of the Week. Cohen and Nadler, the winners. Coming in uh, second would have been Maisie Hirono. And number three, Madam Botox, Nancy Pelosi. Madam Botox. So there you go. Cohen and Nadler first, Hirono in second place, Pelosi in third. Dumbasses of the Week. They're all very well deserving. Uh, and um, again, uh, there's a lot of other people who were definitely in the thick of it, in the running. Um, AOC wasn't far behind. She missed uh, falling into third place by one vote. Uh, of course, Comey, Clinton, and uh, a couple other single and, and double uh, votes. But mostly it was Cohen and Nadler that dominated this week with Hirono uh, being a pretty strong second place. Okay, so there you go. So uh, expecting again this week on Wednesday for these Comey memos. These are the memos that were recently discovered where Comey was literally keeping these. This is not the same Comey memos from the Hillary email. This is these are the, these are memos that Comey was writing to himself uh, about the investigation, uh, the Spygate investigation, and all the things that are going on where he names all the all the sources, he names all the confidential informants, all the uh, plants, all the spies, uh, talks in detail about all the various things that are going on. He lays all this out uh, almost in story form in the form of memos. And these were discovered when they, when Judicial Watch was doing a FOIA request for other things and they stumbled upon these, at which point uh, Judicial Watch wanted them and they went to court and they uh, I guess they had a battle in court, but now these uh, the judge ruled that these could be released. I imagine there will be some redactions, certainly, but um, this should be coming out the 8th. So Wednesday, I guess, is when these memos will be coming out, and I think they'll be fairly damaging. And then, probably next week, sometime next week, no, probably no later than the week after, we'll get the actual, uh, uh, another uh, report that will come out on Comey. So, uh there's uh, a lot going on. You would not want to be James Comey right now. <laughs> you would not be, and I, I think he'll probably be the first, if not the second, maybe uh, maybe uh, McCabe before him, but certainly Comey will be one of the very first people sitting in front of a grand jury and eventually facing uh, criminal indictments, and I'm sure it'll be in the double digits um, in the number of times that he committed various types of acts, uh, abuse of power, um, obstruction of justice, and that's just the Spygate. That's not even the Hillary email investigation, which I think is a separate investigation, which will also yield a lot of problems for uh, Comey. So anyway, we'll keep watching. should be an interesting week this week coming up. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See ya. Bye.